Hey, surprise, everybody. Uh, you know, I don't have an intro for this. <laughs> like I said, I do have a Flickers of Fear intro, but I just never put it over here and I just don't even bother with it. You know what I mean? So yeah, uh, as I said on the stream last night, um, I am doing a, another movie review today. I feel like I haven't done any movie review or book review like live streams in the past couple weeks, I guess because, you know, you guys know, um, you know, because of Tom's dad dying and him being in Mississippi and I don't know. And I was really busy like with all this freelance work and I didn't really have the time or the wherewithal uh, to do any reviews, but I'm slowly getting back into it. And this is one that I watched the other afternoon when I had a couple spare hours and I thought that I would talk about it. And hey, Tammy, how are you doing? I know I'm a little bit late starting today because we had all these errands to run and then I had a bunch of freelance work I had to do and stuff like that. But I really did want to do this because I watched this movie a long time ago and I kind of wanted to talk about it before I forgot it. Before I forgot about it, you know what I mean? Because uh, you know what I mean. Uh, hey, Bessina, what's up? Um, yeah, it's nice to see everybody. So this movie here, I had been hearing about this. It kept turning up on a lot of, because, you know, and I've said this before, I periodically check a lot of, um, you know, lists of best horror movies of the year, blah, blah, blah. So this one was turning up on a lot of people's best horror of 2023 lists. And I saw it pop up on Shudder. It's actually a Shudder original. So I'm not really sure if you can get it on other streaming services. I imagine that you probably can. But I guess that just means that Shudder helped out with the money or the distribution or whatever. Um, so I have Shudder and it's really awesome. So I was like, well, I'm going to sit down and watch it. Because the thing that intrigued me about it. I didn't know a great deal about it other than that it was set in 1945, hence the title, Brooklyn 45. And I tend to kind of like period pieces in horror, depends on what, uh, you know, subgenre it is and stuff. But I was like, so that kind of intrigued me that it was set in 1945. And also it centers around a seance. And Anybody who knows me knows I love a good seance <laughs> in a movie. Um, so I really like movies about seances or movies with seances in them. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. Particularly, I was thinking uh, specifically of the seance scene in The Changeling, which I think is probably my favorite seance scene ever. But I just really like, I like the whole like seance spiritualism vibe. So I like anything that's kind of set around that aesthetic, I guess. So this sounded really good. So I kind of dove right in. Now I didn't know it when I first started watching it, but the movie was directed by Ted Gagan, as, as I think how you pronounce his last name. It's not in any way, shape or form spelled like that, but it's a Gaelic last name. So I actually did before the video, I was like, wait, I don't even know how the fuck you pronounce it. I've seen his name everywhere, but I don't even know how to pronounce it. So I looked it up. And uh, apparently that's the Gaelic pronunciation is Gagan, even though there's way more letters than you would think. Yeah. So, um, so hopefully I got that right. Um, if I didn't, I'm sorry, Ted. But Ted Gagan also directed a bunch of other movies that I've seen over the years. Um, one of them was We Are Still Here from 2015, which was actually pretty good. Uh, I think I wrote a review of it on my blog um, a couple years back. It had Barbara Crampton in it, which is always cool. There's a lot of famous people in it, but I remember her being in it. And uh, I remember liking it, but I don't think I liked the end, I think is how that turned out. Um, he also directed Mohawk from 2017, which I think me and Tom reviewed, if I'm not mistaken. And also... He directed Satanic Panic, which came out in 2019, which is like a horror comedy. I'm pretty sure that we reviewed that one too, because I know I've seen it and I think we watched it together. And I'm pretty sure we did like a matinee about it or something like that. And I remember that one being pretty fun. So this is the same director as all of those, but this is a lot different. It seems like every movie that he does that comes out that I've seen, because this is the fourth movie of his that I've seen, has been like completely different, which I guess is good. So, um... Apparently, the idea for this movie, Brooklyn 45, came about because um, his 2015 movie, We Are Still Here, also had a seance scene in it. And he said, I was constantly getting like fans of the movie like coming up and being like that was their favorite scene. And he was just kind of like, well, why don't I just make a whole movie like based around a seance? You know what I'm saying? So he thought that would be a cool idea. Um, and because he wanted the movie specifically to kind of tackle themes of paranoia and like hatred of the other i guess like during wartime he decided to set it just after the end of world war ii so his dad it so happened was a quadriplegic air force veteran 
Um, he later on, after the war, like he became a history teacher and he actually consulted on this script because the script was written many years ago um, to kind of make sure that everything was accurate. Um, sadly, his dad passed away, I believe in 2019. So he didn't ever get to see the finished film, but he did actually consult on the script. So all the military stuff was correct. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm going to say right off the bat, I dug this, but this is definitely one of those movies that is not going to be for everyone. I think uh, largely that's because it's a chamber piece, essentially. Hello, Kenny. How are you? Um, it very much plays out like a stage drama. You could very easily um, do this on a stage. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's all set in one location, like pretty much just in one room. There's a couple scenes like outside the house and stuff like that, but it's pretty much all in one room. Um, it takes place in real time. Um, and it's pretty much like most of the movie is just long stretches of dialogue that are kind of occasionally interspersed with violence, you know, just like sudden bursts of violence. It's kind of like that. So like I said, I ended up really digging the vibe of it, but I, d I will say that I do think it got slightly repetitive in the second act. Um, it's not long. The movie's not long. I think it's only 93 minutes. But I think there were a few scenes that could have been like shortened or trimmed a little bit just because some of the conversations that they had were a little bit repetitive in the sense that they were kind of, you know, talking about what are we going to do about this? Like they would talk about it like a few times, you know what I mean? When really they only had to talk about it one time. That's all I'm saying. So it's not a big deal, but there probably were a couple conversations and stuff that could have been shortened. Um, but if you're on the wavelength of this movie, um, I think it's like a pretty decent watch, especially, like I said, if you kind of like just these real small, like one location kind of movies. So at the beginning of the movie, we're kind of introduced to the ensemble cast. Now they're all veterans of the war, as well as, you know, the, you're led to assume that they've been like friends for a really long time. You know what I mean? So they're all gathering at this Brooklyn brownstone um by one of them is invited them all there but at first they don't know and you don't know like why they've been invited there they have like suspicions they're like oh well it's probably this but they're not entirely sure like what exactly the deal is you know what i mean so the people in the movie so you have uh marla sheridan and she kind of has a reputation for being like the best interrogator in the country. Like she got people to confess to all kinds of stuff like during the war and stuff like she's really sh shit hot at it. Um, and also maybe engages in some light torture. So there's that too. Um, but she seems like an okay person otherwise. <laughs> like everybody does. It's it's kind of like a very morally gray kind of, kind of people. You know what I'm saying? Um, now she's married to this guy named Bob who I don't know if I'd go so far as to call him like a milk toast, but he's kind of like a little bit more passive. He's not like as militaristic or gung ho. He was like a, he worked at the Pentagon, but he was more like a pencil pusher type thing. So he gets kind of like, you know, sort of razzed by the other people for like not being on the front lines or like not being in the battles. You know what I mean? So he's kind of a little bit sensitive about that. But Marla seems to like him for that very reason, because he's not like so out there and like a killer and everything like that. But he was in the war effort. He was just like in an office essentially. And then you have Major Paul DeFranco, who's this very charming, he's kind of a, I guess he's like a semi out gay man. Like everybody there like knows that he's gay, but I don't know if like the wider world knows or anything. And they just kind of like make jokes about it. Um, and he's actually set to be uh, tried shortly for war crimes, um, which he, and he's very much hoping to get off <laughs> with that. But you know, you find out stuff about that later on. And then you have Major Archibald Stanton, who is this hard ass motherfucker, much like Arlie Ermey kind of thing, not quite as over the top as that, but in a similar kind of vein, you know what I'm saying? And he's just kind of like these no mercy motherfuckers you know what i mean it's just like america love it or leave it you know he was one of those kind of dudes but he's like a good like nuanced character but he's very much you know if you don't like it you can fuck off and fuck these germans and all this other kind of stuff so he's the, very much that kind of dude so this whole get together is being hosted at the home of another one of their friends who is lieutenant colonel clive hockstatter who they call hawk He's actually played by Larry Fessenden, who is in a fuck ton of horror movies, and he directs horror movies as well. Um, he was in, 
I know he was in Ted Gagan's, um, I know he was in We Were Still, we Were Still Here, like from 2015. He might have been in some of his other movies too. I think they work together a lot. So Hawk is having a little bit of a rough time, to say the least. Um, not too long before, you know, prior to the events of the movie. Hawk's wife, Susan, committed suicide by slitting her wrists. And Hawk is really devastated by her death, not least because he feels kind of indirectly responsible for it, um, for reasons I don't really want to get into because it's kind of a spoiler, but he feels guilty. I mean, I guess he kind of does have a right to, but he's kind of beating himself up about it, you know what I mean? Probably more than he should. So when all the people have arrived um hawk tells them and this is i this was my favorite part of the movie i think like because larry fessenden is a great actor i really like him he's a great director too i've really liked a lot of his horror movies that he's directed um but he gives just this fantastically acted monologue um you know about his wife's death and how he lost all of his previous faith in religion like completely and he started seeking solace in spiritualism, which is a pretty common thing uh, that happened back around that, well, a little bit earlier than that time period, but I guess it was happening still here at, during this time too. So he says he's actually not really even sure if ghosts are real either, but he tells them, he's like, you know, the thought of my wife just being completely gone, like, you know, and I'll never see her again and she's just ashes and there's nothing left. Um, he finds that even more horrifying than the idea that her ghost might still be like hanging around and still be maybe kind of mad at him for having a hand in her killing herself or like, you know, um, being partly responsible for the reason why she killed herself anyway. So he has like a long thing about that. And at this point, um, his friends are all really kind of starting to worry him because he seems like he's... Um, going a little bit off the deep end you know what i mean which is understandable um it hasn't been that long since his wife died but he seems like he's kind of losing it a little bit so his friends are like very concerned and they try to reason with him um you know they think he's just right on the edge and they don't know what he's gonna do but he is like pretty adamant he's like look i need you guys here tonight i need you to do this with me this is really important now he wants to prove that susan his wife is still out there somewhere so how he plans to do that is by having a seance in order to contact her and at first you think you know hopefully he'll be able to you know free himself of the guilt that he feels and like doubts about whether she's still out there and stuff like that like he really wants to prove that there's an afterlife and stuff now hawk admits he doesn't really know what he's doing um in regards to all this seance business which i guess no one really does now that i think about it but he's read a bunch of books on the subject and he figures he's just gonna wing it and like see what happens right so he does like some of the stuff that they say in the book now his friends are initially very reluctant to get involved particularly major stanton the hard ass because he just has i mean you know typically he just has absolutely no time or patience for this paranormal bullshit and he suspects that they're all enabling hawk's delusions which is going to be worse for him in the long run um but finally he's just so adamant and he's just so pitiful that they are finally like okay fine you know we'll do this with you even though we're not happy about it you know what i mean so like i said i don't this is a newish movie this just came out in 2023 so i don't really want to spoil too much about what happens because um I think it's this movie's better if you don't know what's gonna happen you know what i mean um but i will say it's not too much of a spoiler to say that despite hawk being clueless in how to run a seance which you know most people would be to be fair um the seance works way better <laughs> than anyone anticipated way better um i mean all kinds of ostensibly supernatural stuff happens like there's this violently banging closet door, like candles light by themselves. Um, there's a, he has like a locket that belonged to Susan that has like a little bit, it looks like a little bit of the fabric that she was wearing when she killed herself, like so it has blood on it. And he has it like inside the locket and the locket starts doing some weird shit that normally lockets wouldn't do. We'll, we'll put it that way. Um, now at first, like most of the participants in the seance, uh, you know, 
particularly Major Stanton, like I said, who's kind of a hard ass, um, are very skeptical. And it, they think kind of the whole thing is a setup. You know what I mean? Um, but eventually the paranormal shit that's going on, it just becomes so obviously real that everybody is just forced to accept it, like whether they want to or not. You know what I mean? Because they're like, there's no way that any of it could be faked. So as I mentioned, this is very new. So I don't want to reveal too much more about the plot from here on out because yeah, this movie is like way better if you don't know what's coming. Like, because there's some stuff that you probably won't expect. Um, but suffice it to say that contacting Susan's spirit seemed like maybe uh, it was not such a good idea after all. Um, because it ends up not only giving Hawk the justification to do something kind of unthinkable, let's put it that way. Um, it also manages to involve this German woman who's like a neighbor of theirs named Hildegard Baumann, um, who actually ends up having some involvement in the reason that Susan killed herself. We'll put it that way. But yeah, she kind of lives down the street, but she kind of gets involved uh, at some point as well. And additionally, um, the way the seance is run and they kind of, you know, it kind of ends abruptly. So they don't, cause you know how in paranormal circles, they always say, if you, if you open the door to the spirit world, you have to close it back again, um, or there's going to be trouble. Um, yeah, they don't do that. So because the door to the spirit world is open, it also ends up having other repercussions. Like it ends up implicating all the other characters in various ways, usually like by revealing horrible secrets about things they'd done during the war. You know what I mean? So this is very much a wartime drama kind of thing. So it's like all of their kind of skeletons in the closet, like come out toward the end. And that's sort of facilitated by the paranormal stuff. So as I said, this is a really solid... Uh, period piece have some really really great acting performances everybody in this is amazing it's really good and the ensemble the way they work together is really good um the cinematography the art direction is really nice like the interior pretty much like i said pretty much it's all in one room but just the way that the um the set is dressed and it's like the inside of the house and stuff like that is really cool looking i really liked the um the color palette and everything like that it was just really awesome really nice like shot compositions and stuff um, and the premise of it is like really compelling. I really dug that a lot. Um, as I said, there are some scenes and particularly conversations that I thought were slightly repetitive, especially in the second act where they're, you know, thinking about, oh shit, like the shit's hit the fan. Like, what are we going to do? Um, it seemed like that kind of went on a little bit because they were having arguments, like kind of similar or the same arguments about what they were going to do. Like, we, I want to do this and I want to do this kind of, and it was a little bit repetitive, but it wasn't that big a deal. Um, and, you know, the acting is so good that I didn't really care all that much, to be honest with you. And it was such, like, the, the way that the mystery was unspooling, like, in all these people's pasts coming out and stuff was, like, so interesting that, you know, that I wasn't really all that bothered. Um, and I'm going to say, too, and that's the reason that I didn't want to spoil too much about it, was that the movie actually did surprise me at several points. Like, I was like, I didn't see that coming, you know what I mean? <laughs> so... Uh, you know, it, so it ends up going up in, in directions you didn't expect. And that was like a big plus for me. Um, and keep in mind too, uh, I always kind of give this as, cause I know that some people that really like horror movies, um, some people like horror movies that are more psychological and some people like horror movies that are like super gory. Some people are kind, that even like horror movies are bothered by gore. And I get that. I, I like all kind of horror movies and gore doesn't bother me. Um, some things do bother me in horror movies like cruelty to animals and stuff, but that's, about it um well cruelty to animals and anything having to do with like barf or poop or anything like that like i don't want to really want to see that but other than that um, gore copious amounts of gore like does not bother me at all but i know that it bothers other people so i will say that this movie even though it's largely i would call it a drama largely um but it does have supernatural elements but there's fair i don't know if i'd say they're fairly sparse but it's it's mostly a drama okay but it does have supernatural elements and horror elements to it. But there is some pretty fairly gnarly gore in here, like at a couple of points. So if that's going to bother you and it's kind of realistic. So if that it's and like I said, some some light torture. So if that's going to bother you, then maybe give it a pass. But it's like brief, but it does. But it is in there. So I thought I'd warn you. Also, just a little side note. Um, if you see like on the thumbnail, I actually love 
love the poster art for this movie. It's great. But to me, like, I know what they were going for. They want it to look like a 1940s horror movie poster. And they largely, whoever the graphic designer was on that, like, kudos. Because they largely succeeded in doing that. Like, the font and the, the way that the art is done and everything, it looks like that. But in in the context of today it makes it look like they're trying to sell it as a horror comedy and it's really not a horror comedy like at all like i said there's there's funny lines in it but it's absolutely not a comedy it's like pretty serious it's a drama so i'm i'm not going to recommend this movie across the board but i would recommend it to anybody who likes like bottle movies like you know everything is in one location and it's a really small cast and movies that are set up more like stage plays because this is at this could absolutely easily be a stage play without really without any changes i think so if you kind of like that then you would probably dig this as well i kind of feel like people that are real more into kind of more traditional horror films or stuff that's like over the top scary or you know pulse pounding action or anything like that um you're probably just gonna think it's boring you know what i mean Um, but if you kind of like more quiet character based kind of horror, then you probably will really dig it. Like I said, there are some horror and supernatural elements in there. It is a seance and the seance does work. So the premise is that the paranormal is real. So there's some ghostly shit happening and there is like some sparse, like violence and gore in there too, but it's not like wall to wall gore or anything. So it's more like a character piece. You know what I'm saying? Um, so if you're, if that sounds good to you, then you will probably dig it. As I said, it's a Shudder original, so obviously it's on Shudder. I don't know where else you can watch it, but I'm sure that, like, Amazon Prime probably has it, because they usually have that stuff like that, but you probably have to pay to rent it, I would imagine. Um, but if you have Shudder, you can watch it for nothing, obviously. And I really liked it. Like I said, I'm not going to recommend it across the board, because I know that these kind of movies are a little bit divisive, with some people saying, it's not even a horror movie, or blah de blah Because I was, I always read... Um, you know, after I watch it and kind of write down my thoughts on it, I always like read the other people's like on Shudder and they were pretty much like some people absolutely loved it. Um, I didn't love it, love it, but I thought it was like pretty great. You know what I mean? Um, but some people were just like, meh, (laughs) you know what I mean? So how you feel about it is largely going to be like what kind of movies you like and everything like that. Um, but yeah. So thanks everybody for dropping by on this little movie review. Um, Hey, Hugo. Hey, Danny. Uh, what's going on? And Tammy said, it sounds pretty interesting. Gonna have to check it out. Thanks for the review. Yeah, I mean, I figure you might probably, you would probably like it. A lot of people did like it. I'm just saying that don't go into it thinking it's going to be like some super scary, like action packed, gory, bloody. It's, It's not like that. It's more like a drama that has supernatural and horror elements to it. But like I said, I love seance movies. So anything that's like based around a seance, I'm going to be all into it. And I liked that it was set in the forties. I thought the like aesthetic of it was really cool. So yeah. Uh, thanks for watching my little, uh, review today. Obviously tomorrow is Friday. So tomorrow night we're going to do our sidetrack show. Um, we're probably going to go out afterwards. So we're going to probably just do like a two hour, you know, (laughs) pregame kind of show. Uh, we might hit mannequins tomorrow night. We'll see how it going. And then Saturday, um, I got to drive, we got to drive over to Ocala because I'm going to my stepdad's funeral. So I don't know if I have time in there. Sometimes I kind of like to do um, movie reviews or book reviews on like Sunday or Tuesday when we don't have other streams, but I'll see if I have time to uh, watch something, then maybe I'll do another one, but we'll see how it goes. But yeah, so thanks everybody for dropping by and I'll see you guys again tomorrow night. Bye.